Hello there viewer, thank you so much for checking out this video. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to make this amazing piece of abstract art. And while I show you how to make this scene, I will also be teaching you how to make procedural textures, do some compositing, animate things automatically, and some other really helpful tips along the way for general Blender use. Now I am using the 3.0 alpha version of K Cycles X. This is a separate build of Blender that renders really fast. It is a paid thing, but it was well worth it because my renders are now about three to five times faster. So let's get on with this scene. First, we're gonna start with the basics of what I'm going to call the core, which is at the center of the animation. And it is an icosahedron or an icosphere. So press Shift A for the add menu, go to mesh and choose icosphere. In the options down here, keep it at two subdivisions. Now my icosphere did not generate in the center of my scene because my 3D cursor was up here. So to reset an object to the center of your scene, select it and press Alt G, which resets the location to 000. I'm gonna size this up by four by pressing S for my numpad and enter. And here is a really cool combination of modifiers that I found to give a really neat hard surface and procedural look. This can be applied to pretty much any mesh. So first with your object selected, go to your wrench or modifiers menu. We're gonna add an edge split modifier, put the degrees to zero. Next, add a wireframe modifier on the bottom and uncheck replace original. So it's making a wireframe, but it is not replacing the original mesh. It's keeping the original there. Next, add a solidify and let's turn it to turn the thickness to, into the negative. So it's expanding outwards. Cool. And lastly, let's add the bevel modifier. And in the bevel modifier, open up geometry, uncheck clamp overlap and uh, put your amount to zero and then hold shift while you click and drag the amount and you just go up ever so slightly to do a very subtle bevel. You may need to zoom in. I'm using my mouse wheel to zoom in here. And then if I click and hold my mouse wheel, I can rotate around. So holding shift and dragging allows you to more fine tune a perimeter. And I'm gonna add an extra face, maybe three segments there to make the bevel a little bit smoother. Cool, happy with that. So in object mode, we can see it a little bit better. All the triangles of the echosphere are being extruded by the solidify. The wireframe is giving a few extra polygons along the edges and the bevel is smoothing them out. That's a nice hard surface look for a number of uses. Let's go to the materials tab and add a material, name it core. Open your surface area if it's not already. Let's make it blue because that'll contrast nicely with the yellow glow of our rings later. Turn the metallic up, specular up, and refs this down to maybe dot one. All right, let's get on with the cool part of this scene, which is the rings. So with our 3D cursor in the middle, which you can reset by pressing shift C, press shift A for add, go to mesh and add a circle. Let's add maybe 80 segments, S to size it up. Now there's nothing in the middle, it's actually just an empty circle mesh. So tab into edit mode and press F for fill, and then I for inset and make the ring however thick you want it to be. Once you're done, click to confirm or press enter and delete that face. There we go. Now we got our first Saturn ring. Let's make a material on it, name it ring. And here's where we're gonna get into some really cool procedural stuff. Hopefully you'll learn something from this and be able to tweak this to make it unique and custom to however you like. So to get to our shader editor to play with the nodes, we need to split our view. To do that, put your cursor in the top right of a window it turns into a crosshair cursor. Click and drag down and you will have split it in half. You can also click and drag over to split it, but to get rid of a window you don't want, click on the one you wanna keep and drag it on top of the one you do not want. And there we go, that's how you can get back to normal. So let's split this, change this top view to shader editor. And now we have the ring material already selected. There's usually nothing visible here. So press the home key on your keyboard and it'll center your, your shader there. Press in to get rid of the side panel if you don't want that there. Now let's make a few nodes here. Let's start with the texture coordinate. Now in this node editor view, you can press F3 for the search function and it makes things a little bit easier. As long as you know what you're looking for, you can just type it in and find it nice and quick. Saves you time. So texture coordinates. Next is the mapping node. Put it next to there. Next is a gradient texture. Next is a color ramp. We'll need a mix RGB node. That's all one word for the searching. A most grave texture. And an object info node. Right there, second one. Okay, 
Arranging them like this will make it easier. Put this one down here, actually. Uh, we're going to duplicate some of these to save us some time. So click on the, the uh, mapping and shift click on color ramp and then press shift D to duplicate those. Put them right around here. There we go. That's about the easiest way we can lay it out. Now let's start connecting things, okay? Plugin generated into your texture coordinates. Then plug texture coordinates into gradient texture, color into the ramp, this ramp into color one, this color output also to this bottom mapping, this one to vector of the noise. Now turn this noise into a 4D noise so we get the W factor and plug in the random object info to W, this into the color ramp and this color ramp into color number two. Change this to multiply and plug all this into the alpha channel. Now let me tell you what the heck is going on here. We want to grab this Musgrave noise texture, which normally makes, you know, like a rough cloudy texture. We want to stretch it around the ring in a circular manner to basically make Saturn rings. We do that by using the gradient texture, which creates a spherical, oh, by the way, it changes to spherical. It creates a spherical data map that allows us to um, turn this into vector information. Vector basically tells a texture or an image or whatever how to apply itself to a mesh. And this will basically have a circular stretched vector and it looks really cool. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But first, we do need to change something uh, in the settings of Blender. So let's switch to Eevee if you haven't already. And go to your Materials tab for the ring texture. Scroll down to the Settings area. Turn Blend Mode to Alpha Blend. This allows Alpha to work. As far as I know, there's not an easy way to do this in Blender Cycles, which I think is ridiculous. I haven't found a solution yet. But for now, we have to use Eevee to turn that on and then go back to Cycles. Now, this whole scene will still look great in Eevee. If you are like an anti-cycles person, your computer is going to melt down into Chernobyl. If you do so, then stick in Eevee. There'll be very few changes, um, but cycles always looks best. Okay. I'm going to turn on ultra denoiser because uh, K cycles X has that and it looks awesome. And I'll maybe turn up my noise to 64. doesn't really matter right now, but I'm just going to knock those out early. All right. So let's get back to making this texture pop. We are plugging all this ring data into the alpha channel so that there will be transparent and non-transparent sections of the whole texture. Um, we want this thing to glow. So turn our emissions color uh, to a, a nice warm golden color and turn emissions up to maybe 20 for starters. Now we do need to tweak a few of these values in here. So let's zoom into the first mapping node, which gives the spherical gradient a location on the ring. We're going to do negative 0.5 for both of them. So negative 0.5. Tab, negative 0.5, enter. That is going to center the sphere along the ring. Now, if I want to preview what I'm doing so far, I'm going to utilize a keyboard shortcut that comes from the Node Wrangler add-on, which is free and included in the later versions of Blender. And it is Control Shift left click on any node, and it will bypass everything and allow you to just see uh, the image data that's coming out of this, this color ramp in this case. So I'm going to move up my blacks a little bit to about here. And look at that, we can already see this circular gradient that I'm making. And this is basically the fall off because we don't want the rings to just stop. I mean, you could just to make it a lot simpler, but I'm going to complicate things and also show you this awesome gradient map texture and what you can do with it. I'm going to put a black over here so that it fades off in the center. Where's that inner ring? There it is. Okay, nice. We can even switch it to ease to make it a little bit smoother. Play with that as much as you want. You can stretch out the, the color ramp to make it a little bit easier to move. And of course you can use these number of values down here. Okay, so this uh, black and white ring is going into this and being blended in multiply mode. I thought I did that earlier. Multiply mode, put that all the way up, with this down here, which is a noise texture that is being wrapped around. Look at this, it, this is not a noise texture, right? But it is. Why is it a circle? Because of this mapping from the circular spherical gradient, sorry, going into the noise node. So we're going to play with the settings here to get this looking more interesting. First, let's move this black point up. Let's move the scale up a lot. And there it is. See that? We have all kinds of fun rings we can make. You can add more uh, you know, finer detail rings. Let's zoom in here. Turn off my overlays by uh, turning up detail, turning down dimension. And there we go. Look at those nice pixel thick lines. I like that. 
Now, why do I have this little guy down here, this object info with random? This is generating a random number for each object that you make. When you shift D or create a new object, they all have a random value assigned to them. And you can use that in nodes in creative ways. In this case, it's gonna randomize the W feature, which uh, as you see, can basically evolve your texture infinitely. So every a ring is going to have its own ring pattern. Um, even if you copy it like this, shift D, size it up, it has its own ring pattern. Shift D, size that up, it has its own ring pattern, so on and so forth, okay? So nothing repeating. All right, now let's preview the main uh, shader here. Control, Shift, click. So basically gets it back to normal mode. Blender is rendering the shader settings and everything is transparent. Why is that? Well, it looks like it's because my uh, noise is being too darkened. Um, I, I don't have enough detail, so let's just bring that, brighten it up a little bit. There we go. Cool, so we can see that. And then as it gets closer to the edges, in and out, inside and outside, they will fade away nice and smoothly. All right, so that's just for the rings. As you can see, there's lots of ways to customize this. We, of course, have the noise size, big or small. You can change detail. You can play with contrast, of course, color. You can even give this like a inside and outside colors if you play with the emissions color and use another you know, gradient map here. So lots of possibilities. Have fun, be creative with that. I'm gonna copy a few of these by selecting it. Shift D, enter. Size it up a little bit. Press RR to rotate. Just give it a random direction. Shift D, enter. Scale it up with S, RR again. Make a nice gyroscopic kind of atom looking design. Have fun with that. You can size these uh, rings differently by going into edit mode. So edge select mode and alt click an inner or outer edge and you can shrink it up or down. Look at that. Make it really big, make it really wide and uh, do whatever you want. Let's make the floor now because I had a really cool procedural sci-fi floor texture that I think a lot of you are going to enjoy playing with later. So shift A and add a plane. Size it up big time. So let's press S50, uh, S2. That's good enough for now. So we have one plane. We're going to move this down. So GZ, just drag it down here. Make sure it's not cutting through any of your rings. And let's make this texture, okay? So new texture, we're still in the shader editor on top. Name it floor. F3 to search, type in V-O-R-O -O for Veronoi texture. F3 again for ramp. F3 again for mix RGB, enter. All right. Now, we're gonna duplicate this three times to give it three different layers of square techno texture that's all procedural and it's gonna look really cool. But first, we gotta set this up. So with your Veroni texture, turn it into a chubby shove. Click over here on the ramp and choose constant. You can keep your black point there, but drag your white down somewhere near the middle and make it a um, medium to dark gray and then make your black change that to a darker gray. There we go, somewhere in that range, because this is going to become a roughness map, which controls how reflective and non-reflective the texture is based on these values. If you do black, that's gonna be completely reflective like a mirror and not great for this scene. If you do white, it'll be diffuse and not reflective, which is also not cool either. So somewhere in the middle on the darker end, which is more reflective, should be good. So let's connect the distance to factor input, connect color to color one. Let's change this to screen mode and move your scale up to somewhere between 20 and 50. I don't really know yet, we'll just have to see. So I'll start with 30. Select all these by holding Shift, click, click, click. Now Shift D to du duplicate it, and then Shift D again to duplicate this down here. All right, I'm actually going to unplug this from this mix, put it into color two. This output will be color number one right here. And then unplug this and plug it into color number two there. So this is basically one technique of layering textures. You can use this for images, for anything, noise, whatever you want. Um, and you can layer them based on these blend modes. I'll use screen for the first one and then difference for the second one to make it really interesting. Plug this into roughness and let's change the scales on all these so that they're not copycats of each other. So 40 for the second one, 50 for the third one. There we go. Let's control shift, click on the difference so we can see what this is really looking like. That looks pretty cool already and I've barely done anything. We can control, like I said, the scale, really large, really small. We can control how much screen overlay there is, which will add brightness, which is less reflective. And the difference is really fun too, because it adds, it breaks up the pattern with some nice, uh, you know, cutout pieces. Maybe make these bigger. 
You can do more of a grid pattern if you do that. That's fun too, by putting, turning your randomness down to zero. Randomness turns the random squares into a grid, like that. But I like randomness up for, for, for the sci-fi panel look. Okay, now let's hijack this texture and turn it into a bump map as well. So F3, type in bump, enter, put it down here, plug in the normal into normal here, and we can just copy this texture and put it into height. Let's change these numbers to dot two, and we can keep that as one. Let's preview the whole shader, and you can turn the color down if you want to maybe medium gray. And for further control of the reflections, we can add a brightness and contrast node right in the middle, which will allow us to turn up or down the brightness and also play with the contrast if you want. Okay, now I'm gonna duplicate this floor into a ceiling piece. So I'm gonna press one for side view. Based on this grid, this is two squares down. So I'm going to Alt D Z to move it up two, two squares up. So Alt D makes a duplicate that is the exact same. So any change I do to this mesh will be applied to this mesh. All right, let's set up the camera. I already have a camera in this scene by default. It's just in a really weird place. And I wanna set it at a custom view. I'm gonna set my 3D view to something that I like, maybe right here. And I'm gonna press Control Shift Zero on my numpad to set the camera to my 3D view. Now I can move it around with G, I can rotate it with R and get it to set how I want. Now what's up with this cutting? Where, where did my ring and my floor go? The clipping on my camera needs to be set. So go to your camera settings, change your end to 1000 or 10,000 if you need to. Add another zero in there just for good measure. And there we go. Wide angles look really cool for this type of art. So let's do a 20, 20 millimeter lens, GZZ to zoom in a little bit. And let's put it close to the floor. Cause I, I found that that looks the most dramatic. You can press RR and hold shift to carefully rotate your camera up. Maybe give it a weird Dutch angle just to make things more abstract. That looks cool. We don't know what's up or down. Maybe it's a, a canyon. Maybe it's a room. We don't know. 45 degree angle is so mysterious. All right, now to help this scene look better, we're going to add a wall around this. Let me press one because I'm getting dizzy. There we go, flat view. I'm going to add a circular wall around the edge to help with the reflections. And I do think my floor is still not big enough. I'm going to select my floor, tab into edit mode, and look at that. The top one's already being edited because they're linked copies, right? They're, they're clones of each other. S for scale and make it pretty big. The size really doesn't matter. You can't go too big. Um, it's fun to have room to move your camera around if you want. Now let's make a tab out of edit mode. So now we're in object mode over here. Shift A and make a cylinder with lots of faces. Let's do maybe 300. Size it up. And once it pokes through the floor or the ceiling, I'm going to size it again with S, but shift Z, which means scale, but not on the Z axis, just on the X and Y. All right, cool. Give it that same texture. Floor. Press zero for camera view. All right, now here's my render view so far. A floor is reflecting my rings, which looks cool. If you want them to be more reflective, you want to darken your roughness map. But to add a point of interest in the center of our art, I'm going to add a glow to the core. So I'm going to select my icosphere, press period on my numpad to zoom right into it. And let's go to object mode to make this a little bit easier. We're going to add another modifier here, and this is going to be the displace modifier, which is going to break apart our mesh just a little bit to see some light coming from in between the cracks. So add modifier, displace, click on new to create a texture. And if you click on these little white and dark bars over here, it'll take you right to the texture settings, which is also down here in the texture tab. Change from image or movie, change it to clouds. Now this displacement is very strong. As you can see, it's destroying our core. Let's turn the strength down by holding shift, put it down to something a little bit more manageable like below dot one. I'm gonna hide these modifiers so we can get back to the very first two, which is the edge, edge split and then the displacement modifier. Let me stretch this out a little bit, there we go. Um, now watch this, if I increase my strength, look what happens, distorts the edge split triangles all over the place. If I didn't have edge split on, they would stay connected. See, just like that. This is a normal, what you would ex expect. But with the edge split, they're all separated. We can also further play with this mid-level to break these apart even more. Um, and yeah, that's really fun. Lots of possibilities there for some cool random shapes. Um, and just to add some interest to something that otherwise would have just be sitting there. Uh, we're gonna add some wobbly wobbly distortion to it 
Um, we can also control where the distortion is coming from, from an empty. So instead of coordinates of this texture being just local, uh, you know, according to the object, we are going to uh, give it a, an object to take location from another object. So uh, I'm just going to three, I'm just going to click right here to put my 3D cursor. Oh, I got my overlays turned off, turn it back on. There we go. Little switch right there is very handy for cleaning up your display. So I'm going to click right here so I know where my 3D cursor is. And I'm going to do shift A empty and then plain axis. So here we have this empty object. It's not a mesh, it's just an empty placeholder. Um, I'm gonna move it over here. Now click back onto your core. Under the object, um, we're gonna do the eyedropper and put it over the empty and click. Now watch this, if I move the empty, its location is being transferred to the core's displacement modifier and it's you know displacing the, the the texture obviously so we can just really easily animate this with a very slow rotation or even just a slow movement from x to y or you know up and down whatever and the core goes crazy and moves all over the place so let's do that here's a really great trick for animating something with very little effort okay <laughs> i call this auto animating we're going to click on the empty and let's just rotate the, do the X. We'll just choose the, the X rotation for the animation. Click on it, type in hashtag frame asterisk, which is for multiply and do a decimal like dot zero one or dot zero zero one. Let's try dot zero one and let's see how fast this animates. So this is going to spin on the X. So what's happening is that that number sign frame means take the frame number that is at say frame 209. That's a frame I'm at right now. Frame 209, multiply it by dot zero one that's what the X rotation is on that frame. The next frame, 210 times dot zero one, that's the new rotation. So you can auto animate things based on the frame number. And that is such a time saver, no keyframes, um, no end point. This will just go on forever and ever. So no matter how long you make your animation, this will just keep on rotating forever. And that is great for rotations, for slow movement, things like that. Okay, now this is a little bit much. Let's slow this down. We can click back on this purple, it's called a driver. Let's add another zero, so dot zero zero one. Oh, that's nice. Nice and slow. Let's make this a little bit stronger. So maybe just go up to one, maybe. That's cool. Now we can see through the cracks, right? So let's uh, put our 3D cursor in the middle. So shift C. Oh, it always zooms out for some reason. Zoom in, zoom in. You can use your mouse wheel, by the way, to zoom in and out. And we're going to add a sphere. Shift A. Just do the basic uh, UV sphere. Size it up a little bit. Maybe not too big. We don't want the triangles to go into it. Um, go to materials. Add new material. Call this... Um, I don't know, center, sphere, whatever. <laughs> um, and click on principled. Now these are all the shaders here. Let's press, just type the letter E and it automatically selects emission. Give it a bright lightsaber blue color. And let's turn this up maybe to 50. I'm not really sure yet. Uh, let's go to render view, see what this looks like. I'm gonna stop the animation. All right, cool. So that's gonna be great. When we add some glow to this, it's gonna look even cooler. Oh, we need to turn back on all of our modifiers that we turned off or hid earlier. They would still render, but I wanna, I wanna see them just so I know what things are really looking like. Cool, those triangles have a nice thickness to them. They're not just flat triangles floating around. Now we can also make this whole core rotate slowly by going to the object properties. Let's do X and Y. So hashtag frame times 0.01. And you can also do negatives too. Uh, so hashtag, I know it's not really hashtag. It's just easier to, I, I guess you just say pound, but you know, I'm a millennial. So I gotta, I gotta say hashtag. And uh, let's go to object mode so it's a little faster to render. There we go. It's still going at <laughs> six frames a second. So about three times faster than this is what we're going to see. And that might be a little too fast for the wobbliness. Yeah, the wobble is too much. So I'm going to find my empty and I'm going to slow down that auto animation. Maybe add another zero in there. Awesome. And the core slowly rotates as well, which makes it more interesting. Um, you can also rotate these guys real slowly. You know, maybe change their, change their kind of orbit or their axis. Um, like this, you know, from here to there, uh, that's really up to you. And also to spice this up, I would suggest um, adding some detail to these that are actually spinning. I don't want to take time to how to do that in this video because that would add probably 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm trying to keep this short. It's already around 20 to 30 minutes. So sorry about that. <laughs> Learning takes time, guys. Ultimately, there's no way around that. Uh, so let's move on to the compositing side to make this really glow. I mean, like literally glow. So let's switch this bottom view to the uh, image editor, switch it to the rendered result. And before we hit render, let's make sure our compositor is turned on. So change your top view to compositor and check on use nodes. 
So we also have nodes in here that is for compositing, which is really just image editing, essentially for each frame. Um, you can, you know, change, make it brighter or darker with curves. You can do some color grading with this guy. You can add glow and all kinds of cool stuff. So let me show you what I have right here. I've got a clever way of adding glow, which just gives me more control over things. So image will automatically be connected to image. In fact, this is probably what your compositor looks like by default. So to add the glow, we're going to press F3 and type in glare. It's one of the filters. There we go. Now this will add glow. I use fog glow um, and put the threshold to around like dot one. We'll play with that later. But the ability to add that on top of the original image is what I like to do instead of messing with this mix. So let's put the mix all the way to positive one, press F3 and type in mix, which is essentially the mix RGB, but it's not called that. It's just called mix. Plug it in right here and make sure the glare uh, in image information is in image two. And then the original image is going to be in image one. So now we can cross it between the original image and the glared image. All right, so let's render this and I'll show you what's going on. Okay, here's a result. Um, it looks kind of bland. I want to. I want these rings to be brighter. So I actually did turn these up to 50. Um, the floor tiles are too large. I want them to be smaller so I can actually appreciate the detail. And the back wall, look, what is going on back there? It looks like a crazy, like glitch, broken glass thing going on. You might like that. I'd like to be a little bit smoother. So let's go back to that compositor view. Um, so right here is my render in the bottom view. I can zoom in a little bit if I want. Let me make it a little bit bigger. There we go. And watch what happens when I turn up the mix from zero to one. So one is just the glow effect because mix right here in the glare node is turned up to one, which means nothing but glare is coming out of this, none of the original data. But I like to use the add mode, not screen, because it actually has a, what, what seems to be a bug to me when I, when I do this on screen mode, it gets some weird artifacts that should not be happening. Um, so I use add instead. And this is a nice way to overlay glowing effects on top of other footage. So when we have it all the way to one, the glare is being added literally through add mode on top of the original footage coming from the image output. Now let's fix the sizing of the floor and ceiling, and then let's make the rings a little bit brighter and let's fix that back wall. So go back to 3D viewport, click on uh, the floor, change the top view to the shader editor. And let's just play with the scales. If I increase the scale number, the texture is actually going to get smaller on the object. So let's just double these. 60, turn 12 into 24, turn 20 into 40. I can already see the squares getting smaller and that's good. Let's click on one of the rings and I have the emission strength at uh, 50. Let's maybe put it up to 100 and see what that does. And the back reflective wall Looks like the UV wrapping needs to be tweaked a bit. So we actually don't have these set on UV wrapping, which is my bad. So let's fix that by plugging the UV map into all three of these vectors. So you can just press F3 and UV map, enter. And by default, it has the one and only UV map that is created. So you don't have to select the UV map there. Now this probably messed up the scaling we just did earlier. <laughs> probably gonna have to undo what I did. But now we can fix these uh, this, this square texture and make it actual squares because I see that a lot of this is getting stretched into a basically rectangle. So let's change our top view into the UV editor. Tab into edit mode, go to face selection mode. I'm gonna deselect all by pressing Alt A and then hold Alt again and select one of these, uh, these faces and it will grab the whole ring, but not the top and bottom. There we go. And now here they are. And you can tell this does not look proportional to what this is. So these need to be much wider. If I zoom in down here and then up here, I hold my mouse over here and press SX and size them up. I'm gonna keep going until I see the square shapes are roughly square. That looks much better. Now it's too big. So I'm going to S and size it down. There we go. That looks all right. Now let's get in our camera view and see what happened to the floor. Yeah, the things are big again, so that's okay. Now we actually have control over using the UV map. So select one of these, it doesn't matter, they're the same. Tab into edit mode with the whole, with the one singular whole face selected. It's right here, one big face over the whole UV map. We can actually scale it up. So S and just drag outwards until you're happy with the size. If you wanted this to look like a superstructure, I suppose you make this really big and the details really small. Um, you know, maybe add, add a little astronaut down here walking towards the center. That would set some scale and some drama 
Maybe another one up here, upside down. That'd be kind of cool too. <laughs> so let's see what this looks like. Tap out of edit mode. Okay, here's another trick to add some interest and some photorealism as well into your scene is, and it is depth of field, which is essentially the zone in front of the camera directly outward from the lens that is in focus. And thus the areas that are outside that zone before and after it are out of focus. So that's how real cameras work. That's how physical optics work. So select your camera, go to your camera tab, turn on depth of field. And now we have to set a distance to basically tell Blender where is the focus set? Is it close, is it far? What object is it hitting? What object is it not hitting? But we can't see this focus distance until we turn on another option. So go up to viewport display and turn on limits. A very oddly named feature, but that's what it's called. I'm gonna hide this outside uh, cylinder, press H to hide it. And now once we find our camera, where is it? Oh, it's down there, yeah. Uh, this little crosshair is what just popped up. See if we turn limits off, we can't see it. So this crosshair right here represents the distance where the focus lies or rather falls. So if we want the edge of this uh, core to be in focus, we should do it right here. If we want something behind it, drag it out here. But I like the front-ish uh, section of an object to be in focus. You can set it to a specific object using this, but it focuses on the center, which may not be what you want. If you have a moving camera, this is really handy. You don't have to do anything. But if you have a stationary camera, you can just set your distance and you know set it and forget it kind of deal. Also, I want to brighten up the core a little bit more. Let's put it at 100. There we go. All right, so uh, this is focusing right here. The size of the in-focus area is controlled by the f-stop. Again, just like a real camera, we've got f-stops, which is also your aperture opening. If you have a small number, that means a large opening in the camera lens, which means uh, shallower depth of field. I probably just blew your mind if you're not into photography. You don't know what the heck I'm talking about. But for my photography nerds out there, if there are any, you're like, oh, yes, I know exactly what's going on here. So I'm going to set a number one for f-stop which is close to impossible with a physical lens, but hey, we're in Blender, so you know we can break the rules. And let's see if this gives us that nice depth of field, blurry background and blurry foreground effect. To accentuate that or exaggerate that, we should have something close to the lens, which there really isn't right now. So let's add another ring, Shift D, R, R to rotate it. Let's get an interesting orientation that we're not really using yet. And I'm gonna scale this up really big so that it's kind of crossing right underneath or right by the camera lens, like that should be cool. And not too much, we don't want it to cover it too much. And make sure your clipping is uh, is set good. So in your camera settings on the top, uh, clip start, just do like zero, zero, 001. So if something is really close to the camera, it won't just magically disappear. All right, let's try that. And again, I'm gonna do my before and after trick. So this is slot two, let's move to slot one and render this new render in slot one. Something else that would be fun to add to the scene would be a little astronaut on the on the ceiling and or the floor, maybe both in different directions, kind of looking up at this thing. Maybe a spaceship landed here, you crash landed, you know, I'm coming up with all these cool ideas. You guys just really need to just run with these. Send me these renders, please, because uh, if I did it in the tutorial, it would just take way too long. So uh, someone make an amazing piece of art and don't take 30 minutes like me <laughs> and send it to me because I think I'm going to eventually do a video of you guys' renders. You guys have been sending me stuff that you're making based on my tutorials and stuff you've made with my products. And I really appreciate those. They're super fun to see see someone else's vision and approach to making something with something that I've stared at for, you know, 20, 30 hours. Uh, but you guys take it and just make something that I never even thought of. So that's been really fun. So thank you so much. If you did know, I do make 3D assets for sale and for use commercially or educationally. They're on my Gumroad and my Blender Market account. There's spaceship assets. There's kit bash stuff. There's materials, engines with flames, really cool stuff. So go check that out if you're interested in building some stuff and not spending hours and hours making each individual piece. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment down below what you thought of this video. If I skipped anything or messed something up, let me know too, and I'll help you out. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.